السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of them and to bless every single one of us as well, our offspring and progeny, those to come up to the last day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep them upon the path and may he keep us upon the straight path as well. My brothers and sisters, every one of us is meant to be seeking knowledge. None of us can be known as a person who has all knowledge because the one who is the owner of knowledge is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He alone knows absolutely everything. He is the creator and therefore he knows. As for us, we may have different pockets of knowledge, some in different fields, and we may have excelled a little bit, but none of us will have all of knowledge. And this is why it is only correct, even for those who have studied the deen, to be known as students of knowledge or those who are still studying. They say talibul ilm, a person who is studying or a student of knowledge, one who is seeking knowledge. So we are all seekers of knowledge, myself included. In a manner that if I were to find out that something I had known is actually incorrect or wrong, I should not feel even for a moment embarrassed to correct myself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide myself and yourselves. And how would I know that what I have learned is wrong sometimes? Or how would I know that what I have said is wrong? If what I have said is proven to be against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said or what the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught, then in that particular case, I'm wrong. If there is something revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or stated or taught by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is contrary to what I say, then I'm wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant myself and yourselves beneficial knowledge. We look at the dua of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to make so many duas, supplications, which sometimes if we study them carefully, we would ask ourselves, why did he say this? Why did he ask for this when he had it already? You know, we take a look at, for example, uh, him seeking protection from laziness when he was far from laziness, but he still sought protection from laziness. Him seeking protection from miserliness, from cowardice and various other uh, bad habits and uh, inclinations yet he was far from them and this shows that he did this also for us to be able to learn that if you would like to if you would like to lead a life close to perfection or heading towards perfection you too need to correct yourself and you too need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for these elements of goodness and to be protected from bad and evil. So part of what he said, Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una. Oh Allah, teach us that which will be beneficial to us. Subhanallah. Wanfa'na bima allamtana. Oh Allah, benefit us from what you have taught us. Amazing. He was the one whom wahi and revelation came to. And yet this is what he said. And then he continues, Subhanallah, something amazing. Oh Allah, we seek your protection from eyes that will not cry for your sake. Which means when we talk of Allah, when we read the verses of the Quran, when we are reminded about our duties unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, literally tears should be rolling down our cheeks. It's an opportunity that is sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, given to us. And he says, Oh Allah, I seek your protection from having a belly that will never be filled, from not being content, a soul that is not happy, not content. Yet he was always content, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So much so that even during the journey to Ta'if that he had made and the persecution he faced there, he was still the most content of all. When he was asked, would you like these people to be destroyed between the mountains? And he said, no, if they do not accept, perhaps from their progeny, there will be people who will accept and as we see today, mashallah, ta'if within the Muslim land. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all iman. Amin. And then he goes on to say, Oh Allah, I ask you to protect me from a prayer that I would make to you, a supplication that is not responded. 
And we know that Allah responds and Allah replies. But sometimes what happens, we are asking for something and we want it our way. I give you an example. Sometimes a person wants to be able to go for Hajj. Okay. So they say, oh Allah, facilitate this Hajj for me or the Umrah for me. And for some reason, the visa doesn't come through. I don't know if you've had that in our part of the world. You're quite fortunate if your visa comes through. You're told in advance that, you know what? Your name has come through. So it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a dua that is good. But sometimes the way we lead our lives is such that Allah has asked us to do so many things and we haven't done them. And then when we ask Allah to do something, we want him to do it for us immediately. And this is why one narration, the Prophet ﷺ makes mention of a man who's calling out to Allah, you know, stretching his hands in dua and asking Allah, crying to Allah. And yet his clothing is haram, his food is haram, his drinking is haram, his nutrition is haram. Allah says, فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لذلك. How can such a person expect such a response? Still from the mercy of Allah, he gives. But the person doesn't deserve, to be honest with you. A lot of us, myself included, perhaps due to our weaknesses, we don't even deserve to be breathing the fresh air that we are breathing. But Allah says, no, my mercy, I will give it to you. You are trying, you're a worshiper of mine. But who knows upon what condition a person will die. And this is why we say, my brothers and sisters, very importantly, if you'd like to learn knowledge, if you would like to know, if you would like to increase your knowledge, you need to quit. Sin. Be conscious of Allah and Allah will teach you. Allah will ensure that you know. Your knowledge will increase. You know, a Shafi'i, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, his name was Muhammad ibn Idris a Shafi'i, the Imam, the great Imam of jurisprudence. He uh, complained once to one of his uh, mentors known as Waki' ibn al Jarrah, Rahimahullah. And he says, I complained to Waqi' ibn al-Jarrah about my memory and Shafi'i had a powerful memory. Trust me, he had a powerful memory and he's still complaining about the memory. Someone like myself and yourselves, perhaps our memories are weak. You know, we, we can't even memorize a phone number to save our lives. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. I think it was the case a few years back when we could do that. But technology has made us lazy. So Shafi'i with that powerful memory, he still complains. And he says, I complained to Waqi' ibn al-Jarrah regarding my, the memory. And he guided me saying, quit sin, be far away from sin, anything sinful, stay away from it. Because knowledge is the nur that Allah grants those and it does not come together with a person who is sinning. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us really. And this is why we mentioned yesterday and we are repeating it today. One of the best gifts of Allah upon us after our iman and so on is the fact that we have an opportunity to turn to Allah to make amends. We have an opportunity to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to wipe out the bad we've done in the past. Very easy. You admit, you regret, you ask Allah's forgiveness and you promise not to do it again. And it's wiped out. That's the promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made. But if you have usurped the right of a fellow Muslim or a fellow human being, then you need to seek forgiveness from them as well. That's the fifth condition when you have wronged a fellow human. So if there is a sin committed between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, four conditions, we've mentioned them. But if you've added an individual, say I stole someone's money. I can't just say, Ya Allah, I stole these million, this million, but I ask you to forgive me. I won't do it again. I regret and I repent and you're still going to enjoy that million. And the brother's asking you for the million. You need to return it or you need to tell him, please forgive me. And if he says, okay, then it's fine. If he, if he says no, then you've got a problem because you will either sort the matter out in this world or on the day of judgment, Allah will choose how the justice will be served. So all this we would only know if we took a moment to learn. And my brothers and sisters, the importance of learning is such that in this world, we all understand it and we realize it when it comes to earning and leading a life that is temporary. We know that we have to go to school. We know that we have to give, teach our children. We know we have to send them to good schools so they can learn. And many of us are concerned about sending our children to English schools so that they can learn the language without us realizing that, do you know what? The Arabic language will probably come in more handy for them in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are not saying it's not important to learn English. We are speaking here today in English. But subhanallah, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to study the Quran. Quran 
are they not going to ponder deeply over the verses of the Quran or are its locks sealing their, heart, their hearts? Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to us. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also uh, in Surah Al-Qamar, many times the, the verse is repeated. Indeed, we have made the Quran, we have made this revelation easy to read, to memorize, to understand. Three things are primarily included in that term, dhikr. Indeed, we have made this Quran easy to read, to understand, and to put into memory. Is there anyone who is going to do that from amongst you? And the answer should be, yes, I'm attempting and I will try and I will try my best. And this is why even if you've reverted to Islam, it is your duty to make an effort to learn the ch some of the chapters of the Quran, even the shorter ones off by heart so that you can fulfill your salah. Imagine if the salah was to be read in the English language, there would be discrepancy. People would dispute. Someone would say it means this and the other one would say it means that. But the Quran being read in the Arabic language in Salah is such that Subhanallah, you will find the protection of the book of Allah by the will of Allah through the instruction of Allah in a miraculous way. Even if you've reverted to Islam a month back, I'm sure you would be able to read the first surah of the Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha. And even if you didn't understand the Arabic language, you would still be able to read it. Why? Because you made an effort you made an effort to adjust yourself to the revelation. And this is part and parcel of your contribution towards the protection of the book. Subhanallah. And the same would apply to various other short surahs of the Quran. You know, we have Surah Al-Ikhlas, Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. We have various other surahs that are there, Al-Asr, which is a very sm short surah. And I'm sure we would have learned these off by heart. This is part and parcel of the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, it's not enough to just memorize the Quran without being bothered about the meanings of it. We need to go into the meaning that is part of knowledge. The source of all knowledge is revelation. Allahu Akbar, Allah, the creator, the maker, the nourisher, sustainer, provider, the one who created everything in existence from nothing from nothing he created absolutely everything he is the source of all knowledge so what he has revealed would definitely be the source of all knowledge and this is why science and scientific discoveries change from time to time they discover something today and tomorrow they discover they were wrong so they come back and they correct it they correct it 20 years down the line they have some new apparatus that figures out that something we thought a long time back is not accurate but the quran doesn't change and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it quite clearly we will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves until it is proven beyond any doubt whatsoever that it is the truth. What is the truth? One of the interpretations of it is the Quran is the truth. Whatever Allah has revealed is the truth. How will it happen? It will be proven over time that the what, meaning what the Quran has made mention of in terms of science, in terms of various other matters of creation, they will be proven to be correct as time passes. So today, if you have technology or scientific discovery negating something in the Quran, a true believer would know in the heart that you know what? Science is wrong. We are still correct. Subhanallah. There will come a time, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years down the line, when they will have apparatus or they will be modernized to the degree that they will be able to understand that indeed it is valid, it is correct. And this is why the discoveries on a global level are being made manifest in such a way that people are not mentioning the Quran yet. Things were already in the Quran, but because if they were to say, look, we discovered this now yesterday, but this has been in the Quran for 1400 years, it would, it would actually be a call towards Islam. So they've carefully chosen to avoid that and to say, you know what, this is our own discovery. No one makes mention of Islam or the Quran and so on, or even Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, if you take a look at prophetic medicine, for example, it's obviously through revelation. Because the Prophet ﷺ was the one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave revelation to and taught him absolutely everything. And part of what, meaning whatever he said was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
ينطق عن الهوى إن هو إلا وحي يوحى Whatever his utterances are, are not from his desires and whims and fancies. Rather, rather they are from revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophetic medicine is such that today people are becoming conscious of the olive and the figs and so many other things that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has spoken about or has used in his life or they are mentioned in revelation, subhanallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us. This is knowledge. Knowledge is definitely an ocean that has no coast. I'm sure you've heard the Arabic saying, Knowledge is an ocean that has no coast whatsoever. If anyone from amongst us thinks that I know, I know, and I know everything, what they know is not knowledge, it's something else. Because none of us can actually know absolutely everything. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Similarly, a person might have an experience in a certain field they would know a little bit more you know like you have doctors for example not all of them are the same some have specialized perhaps you might have an orthopedic surgeon you might have uh, you know a general practitioner you might have a person who's an uh, ear nose and throat specialist and so on people have specialized you might have a gynecologist you may have for example uh, a chiropractic someone might say that okay this person is not exactly like the rest but subhanallah they are all needed at, at certain times and they all have their own expertise and they all have something to offer but each one is called a doctor yet one may offer you advice, but the professional advice, you will have to go to the expert in that particular field. Did you ever know that when it comes to scholars, it's a similar scenario where certain scholars are experts in tafsir, some are experts in jurisprudence, some are experts in more than one field, some are experts in a very broad you know, spectrum, some perhaps they might just be experts in one small you know, aspect of the deen, but such an expert that they, their contribution to Islam is great. This is why we say appreciate them all. Some are experts in perhaps interfaith, matters and they, they would know they have studied and spent a lot of time studying other faiths in detail. So to ask a general person uh, or a, a scholar, for example, who may not have studied that type of depth in that particular subject, uh, it may be wrong or he may not know. And it's up to the scholar to say, I don't know. Subhanallah. Did you ever think, you know, there was once an Arabic examination. It's a true story. So we, we taught the children Arabic and mashallah, you know, Arabic is quite a deep language, mashallah, where there is a will, there is a way. So when it came to the examination, the children were asked questions. So the question had, you know, before you answer that question, you have to know what it's all about. So the section says, answer the following questions in correct Arabic sentences. So the sentence has to be correct in the Arabic language. And then they ask you a question. Now, some of the children wrote, La Adri. That means, I don't know. Is that answer correct? It's a full sentence. It's Arabic language. There's nothing wrong with the linguistics there. And the child doesn't know. He's telling you the honest truth. You have to tick it off and say, Mashallah, it's the right answer. But you didn't know. But subhanallah, you're testing me Arabic language here. My linguistics correct. So now you've got to go back because these are smart kids today. They'll come to the teacher and say, hey, listen, you were testing me. Is there anything wrong with this answer here? You know, you asked me, for example, what is on the table, you know, in the Arabic language. And I told you, I don't know what is on the table. Subhanallah, we ask Allah to grant us ease. You know, the children of today, mashallah, they make us feel like we didn't know much. Do you know that? Allahu Akbar. But trust me, we did. I mean, I'd like to think that I knew quite a bit as well. Masha. Didn't you guys know as well? Alhamdulillah. But it's the technology and the way, you know, the wit of the children and so on. Subhanallah, it's on a new level altogether. However, going back to what we were saying, it's important for us to realize that when a person says, I don't know, do not become irritated. Don't, not at all. They've helped you by saying, look, I'm not going to give you the wrong answer. I don't know. Perhaps we'll have to find out. You can go to someone else. You can learn it from someone else. Or maybe I can find out for you. Like when children are inquisitive, they will always ask their, their parents something. And they will say, mom, can you please tell me uh, something about the moon or the sun or about salah or about anything else? You know, and if mom doesn't know the answer, 
One of the best ways of responding is to say, I'll find out for you and then go back and find out so you can help the child with the answer. Because if you just say, I don't know, sometimes it's an important matter. The child might ask the wrong person who will give the, the child the wrong answer. And you had an opportunity to rectify that and you didn't. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us all. Uh, just as I would like to open the floor, inshallah, for questions in a few moments, I'd like to remind ourselves that when we ask, we never ever ask a question to prove a point. You know, sometimes we've just had something and we want to say, right, uh, tell me something. Is this allowed and that allowed? And when, when, when the scholar says or the, the student of knowledge happens to say, no, it's not allowed. And we look at back and we say, see, I told you, I told you. It's not there to prove points. It's there to learn, to study, to want to know for ourselves by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, if you are confused, you may ask. And at the same time, if you get an answer, I don't know, don't be upset. Because you may hear some of those tonight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and may he grant us ease. Another thing is when we're asking questions, we're not testing the speaker. We're not testing the person. We're not testing them. We, we're actually asking because we want to know. You know, it's one day I was actually sitting and I, I don't really enjoy Q&A. To be honest with you, the reason is uh, I've had some very bad experiences in the past. And mashallah, tabarakallah, one of them was a person who came up with a lot of questions which they had prepared. You know, these examination questions that they must have had for something. And you've got to mention seven secrets of the Quran in this thing. And how many times is this mentioned in the Quran? And that, hey, hang on, my memory is not that. I will have to get to the book and then I'll tell you how many times this is mentioned in the Quran. You know, you might think that, okay, the guy knows it off by heart. The reality is no. If I do, I'll tell you. If I don't, I'll tell you, look, I need to go back and see. So you don't come and ask me how many times is this word mentioned in the Quran and that word. To be honest, you can check it up. Subhanallah, you can ask the experts or give me some time. I'll get back to you, inshallah, and I'll figure it out for you. By the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah benefit us all and grant us goodness and ease. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who make an effort to learn. Because that is the key to paradise. You will never be able to protect yourself from evil if you don't know what it is. You won't be able to do that which is upright if you don't know what upright is. So you need to learn what is upright and you need to learn what you're supposed to be abstaining from in order for you to be able to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and paradise. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all Jannah and inshallah I open the floor for questions now. Just a minute. Just taking a quick break on that one inshallah. I uh, request uh, Sheikh Abdul Samad, the president of uh, Indian Islai Center, to kindly present a moment as an appreciation to Sheikh Mufti Naik. Before I open the floor for questions, just a few important rules that we should be following all through the session, inshallah. The first being that uh, we like to request all the questioners to keep your questions as brief as is possible. This is not a lecture session and you're supposed to give time for the speaker to give more an, uh, of the answer inshallah. So keep your questions as brief as you possibly can. The questioner must mention their name and their profession. This will be helpful for the speaker to give answers in relation to your background inshallah. The sisters may not mention their name but do mention your profession inshallah. As we will have some non-Muslims with us as well, and they are our guests, we're going to give first priority, first preference for them to be in the questions, to give the question, inshallah. If there's anybody standing in the line who is a non-Muslim, both from the brothers or the sisters, we request them to, inshallah, take the first preference and, inshallah, put your questions forward. We will not entertain any question that is politically influenced or has any sectarian nature inshallah this is very important because anybody not doing so or not following the decorum of the session might be given to the authorities we request you to put your questions on Islam questions related to how we can be as Muslims to the best of our capacities and be the ones who submit to Allah Azza wa Jal as Muslims Finally, we've got two, question, two mics in the, on the floor. So once on my left for the brothers, the brothers may line up. And likewise, we've got one in the sisters. And the sisters may line up, inshallah. And we shall begin with the first question from the brothers. Okay, my name is Habib. And I'm a student. And I have a question. Is it allowed to listen to us? to a song which doesn't have music or any bad words. 
Jazakallah khair. Is that your question? Yes. That's a beautiful question. Uh, the answer is yes. If it doesn't have music and it doesn't have bad words, it has a good meaning, it's encouraging you to do something <laughs> encouraging you to do something good, uh, then alhamdulillah it's permissible to listen to that. Wallahu alam. Allah knows best. Jazakallah khair. There's a sister who wants to take shahada. MashaAllah. Barakallah fi. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Sister, is the sister there? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Sister, you know about the pillars of Islam, don't you? Yes. Okay, you, you accept it as your faith, inshallah? Yes. Repeat after me. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa. Illa. Allah. Allah. Wa ashhadu. Wa ashhadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Rasulullah. <laughs> Rasulullah. I bear witness. I bear witness. That there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. That is the, that has none. That there is none. That there is none. Worthy of worship. Worthy of worship. Besides Allah. Besides Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness. That Muhammad. That Muhammad. May peace be upon him. Peace be upon him. Is the messenger of Allah. Is the messenger of Allah. MashaAllah. Barakallah fiqh. Allahu Akbar. My sister, uh, it's important for you to know that uh, it's a very, mashallah, it's the correct decision. And we are so happy that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided you. We ask Allah to guide every one of us. Uh, please continue in your quest to learn. Learn as much as you can. For indeed, the more you learn, the more you will love the deen. And uh, the, the less you know, the more you will dwindle. Try and get into good company. Uh, the company of those who are interested in knowledge, the company of those who are interested in reaching out to fellow human beings, far from extremism and intolerance. It's important. It's an important clause. It needs to be far from extremism and intolerance. If there's anything you're doubting, uh, seek from those who have knowledge and ask them. And at the same time, remember one thing. Your company and those you mix with will play a big role in determining what type of a Muslim you will be. So congratulations, mabruka, mashallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to bless you in every way and to make it easy for you, this beautiful step you've taken, inshallah. We hope that it will be a means of your entry into Jannah and ours as well. Ameen. Ameen. Jazakumullah. Yep. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. My name is Zuhair and... Uh, I work in an Islamic uh, bank and my question is uh, to make it short that that I have uh, made income and my uh, have certain income and commission based salary I received and to be honest I want to leave the banking uh, field so I have decided to leave it so is that money that I have earned is it halal for me or haram for me what was your job uh, as a car finance uh, car finance executive. You said it was an Islamic bank? Yes. Okay, my brother, as much as my opinion is very, very strict when it comes to banking, and I don't really understand the concept of Islamic banking in full, there are certain aspects that make sense and some that don't to me. And I haven't gone in depth with some of them. There are experts of Islamic banking that see that there's nothing wrong with Islamic banking. And if that's the opinion you'd like to follow, then your income is halal. And so far, whatever you've had is permissible because there are scholars uh, who have said that it is permissible. Like I said, not my specialization. I've never understood certain aspects and I'm saying it loud and clear for everyone to hear. But I'm not one of those who would actually just condemn a scholar because he sees differently from me. Uh, if that is their opinion, perhaps they know something I don't know. And therefore, I cannot say that your income is haram. Uh, you know, I, I'm actually wondering why you'd like to leave that, that whole field. Uh, is it because you have a doubt within your heart? Can I say? Yeah. Yes, you can say. Um, yes, I do have a doubt, and to be honest, I'm not sure. So that's why I don't want to risk my afterlife. To be honest. Jazakallah khair. May Allah bless you and grant you blessings in every single way, and may Allah grant you jannah, and may He open your doors of sustenance, my brother, for you and your family. If you're if you're in doubt yourself, then you quit. Is, is the correct step, inshallah. And uh, I'd like to hope that whatever you've had so far, bi idnillah is halal based on the opinion of others. Jazakallah khair. Wallahu a'lam. Thank you so much. I had two questions to ask. Is there any difference between the pray, uh, way of praying namaz between men and women? 
That's the, that's the first question. Yeah, and the second one is, I've heard that there is Shafi Imam and uh, Hanafi and all that. But I want to know that which is the right one to follow as a new Muslim. Uh, to be honest, uh, Jazakumullah Khair, the first question is, is there any difference between the Salah of a male and a female? Uh, if you take a look at the scholars of jurisprudence, there is a difference of opinion between the Hanafi scholars and the rest of the scholars in this regard. So whilst the Hanafi scholars do say that there are some differences between a man and a woman's Salah, uh, the rest of the scholars say that there is no difference because it's not proven uh, with authentic ahadith. And as we've said, these scholars of jurisprudence have all proven their points with various ahadith and so on. The confusing factor is where, uh, a, what should a person do if, say, I've accepted Islam? And, uh, you know, what, what school of thought do I follow? That's a very important question. What I've found to be the most practical answer is where you are and those who've actually assisted you in accepting Islam and so on, the entire environment. Not every place would be similar to Dubai here where you can actually affiliate to as an institution of this nature that would probably teach you uh, what is closest to the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah you, we have different countries and I know that we face this challenge in so many countries where you've accepted Islam and everyone around you happens to follow the madhab of Imam Shafi'i. So when it comes to belief, everyone is one. Belief will not differ. But when it comes to matters of jurisprudence, a person says, I mean aloud, a person says it softly, a person ties the, their hands on the chest and someone else ties it on their belly and someone else might raise their hands and someone may not. Matters of jurisprudence are not as important as matters of faith and belief. So uh, it's important for us to know that in belief we don't differ. But when it comes to matters of jurisprudence, the four schools of thought are widely accepted by the entire ummah. So we, it, we would be wrong to discount a school of thought based on the fact that, you know what, uh, it's not the school of thought that I follow. Uh, when it comes to jurisprudence, I hope you're following the answer that I'm giving. Uh, and at the same time, what we need to know is perhaps those who are around us, it would be most practical for us to learn jurisprudence similar to what they have. If you have an opportunity to correct yourself and to, to, to ensure that what you are doing to know the hadith that you are following that would be the best there comes a stage right at the beginning when you might not know every hadith for what you're doing and as you grow you will then begin to learn more and more in terms of uh, the hadith which substantiates what you're doing and then you will be a more knowledgeable person so I hope you've understood what I've said. May Allah make it easy for us all. We do acknowledge that there are many differences of opinion across the globe. It does not remove us from the fold of Islam as such if the, uh, the jurisprudence is different. And if, for example, we are following uh, one of the four schools that are there, uh, or even if we are following the Quran and the Sunnah, uh, as per the understanding of the predecessors and so on, it does not remove us from the fold of Islam. But some people actually use the opportunity to chisel through these differences in a way that they want to split the entire ummah. I'd like to hope that belief-wise we should be all the same. We should be all acknowledging what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. And inshallah in, in, in that front without disagreement. As for jurisprudence, I've just mentioned that it's okay. Uh, as time passes, as you learn, you can correct yourself by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today we also have you know, a lot of online classes and courses uh, which are doing a lot of good work. It depends, you know, you need to perhaps ask the scholars around you to guide you to something that would be suitable for your, uh, you know, method of learning. Some schools are online in terms of Skype and so on, and others operate in different ways. May Allah make it easy for us all. Jazakumullah khair. Hello, sir. My, my name is uh, Nila uh, Mittal, and I'm a student here. I have one, uh, one question, which is short. When I was coming here inside, I saw that uh, uh, that uh, men entrance is is uh, is uh, separate and uh, women entrance is uh, is separate. I just want to know that why men and uh, find uh, uh, women are being separated. I mean, I've attended many other uh, functions. I'm I'm a Hindu basically, so I attend Hindu functions and I, I also attend uh, these these functions in hindu one i see that uh, that we all uh, uh, sit together but here i'm seeing that uh, there's a there's a separation here as you can see may i know the what it holds in in islam my beloved brother thank you so much and i appreciate the question and your honesty and your bravery to have come up and questioned it it's good the reality is bottom line when we believe 
We take instruction from Allah and His Messenger. That's how it stops. You follow what I'm saying? When we believe in Scripture, we've, we've believed in Allah. We did, not impose this, we did not impose this ruling on the rest of the globe. But for us, we believe in Allah and His Messenger, so we take instruction from them. If they have said something, it's closed. The chapter is closed. That's what makes us Muslim. And if we understand the logic, Alhamdulillah, that's good enough. If we don't understand the logic, there may come a day that we may, but that doesn't mean we won't follow the rule up to that day. We will still be following the rule. However, if you take a look at, uh, you know, the nature of a male and a female, Islam has protected the female such that any uh, attempt to degrade a woman to a sex object in any way whatsoever is actually blocked and stopped and considered taboo and a sin. So I don't mean to pinpoint or to pick on any other cultures, but if you take a look at people who perhaps um, are not that disciplined, you would find that you know the women who who lead lives that are uh, not full of the level of spirituality they're supposed to be upon would probably spend so much time, you know. Uh, with decorating themselves in order to go out of the home to impress people who are not allowed to touch them and who are not allowed to have anything. So basically the man would look and he'd see someone far better than his wife and he goes back home and he cannot you know, tolerate his wife because he's seen so many others. They've displayed themselves wholly and openly to the rest of the world and you can't have them. So it leads you to sin, we believe. And it leads you to not appreciating what the Almighty has blessed you with. You know, if everyone... In fact, I was just talking to one of my friends and I was saying, you know, if all the women had to wear loose clothing and if everything the men saw was women in loose clothing, we would appreciate the figures of our own women because we wouldn't really be able to say, oh, I've seen figures far better than yours. Now you're becoming fat and ugly. And astaghfirullah, she's just gaining a bit of weight because of children you have actually got with her. So to preserve the woman and to treat her for what she is and her level, we are taught a few things. One of them is, both men and women should lower their gaze. You know, protect your gaze. If you lower your gaze, Wallahi, the day you look at what you're supposed to be looking at, you will appreciate it so much because to you, they, you know, you are not basing the, 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 the beauty of your wife on some of some women you might have seen on, on, on the internet or perhaps on the television or on the streets, but you're basing it on who she actually is. She's sacrificed, she's actually, you know, come forth and you have nothing in your mind to, to, to gaze it be with besides her and this is something really very respectful of us of a woman similarly the issue of dressing in looser clothing and this is for both male and female is also in order to respect where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly advising us to dress in a way that people would not judge you based on your size and shape and what you look like I know of a lot of girls and women who become depressed because of their complexion and because of their size and because of various other matters and sometimes the men rub it in and they don't understand it's prohibited to do that so they are taught to dress in a specific way out of Allah's gift to them to say your value is not from your shape your value is not from your complexion you know people they go extraordinary lengths in order to just you know lose a bit of color May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. And then the last point I'd like to raise is when it comes to functions, uh, we know that a lot of the times, you know, if you have women and men mixed together, and I'd like to give you an example with all due respect of some churches that have women and men dancing together they, and, and they, they are all operating together and they move around together and Marriages are breaking, my brother, because you get very angry if someone had to look at your wife and smile at her and you know, wow, you know, there's two, three types of smiles. You, know, you can tell straight away there's something wrong here. And then phone numbers are exchanged and things happen. So w we treat a woman as though, hey, I need to get to this woman. She's too good. She's beautiful. Wow, I just need to get there. And then we use them and we leave them after a while and we're gone to someone else. And this keeps on happening. I'm not saying it will happen. Because we are responsible people. I mean, today, perhaps if we had to meet one or two women, that wouldn't happen perhaps. But Islam says, close the door from the beginning. Just close the door so that you don't need to worry. Subhanallah. So if you look at a masjid, if, you, if I want to concentrate, I need to actually have the women uh, separated from me and they need to have me separated from them because I need to concentrate on what I'm doing and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, if I get a beautiful scent of a female while I'm praying, Astaghfirullah, may Allah forgive us, what would be...
condition of the mind. Imagine you're praying and next thing, what happened? Hey, the smell. Ooh, I want to look at that figure. Ooh, look at that. You are insulting Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time you're not appreciating the gifts of Allah. Today we have a beautiful discussion of faith and spirituality. If there are women sitting in the midst of men, I'm not saying it would have been exactly the case, but you know how the world has been sexualized completely. We are living in a hypersexual stage of the globe. It's the worst it ever was. Before people used to greet by shaking hands. Today a lot of the people greet by sexual statements and utterances and perhaps even you know intentions of taking people to bed whom they're not supposed to be with it's a fact may Allah strengthen us and may he forgive us and our children may he strengthen us all so if we have a separation there is a lot of respect that is one thing you can notice can I ask you one question can you notice the amount of respect we have for females if you notice there are females on my right they will have definitely noticed that this man did not give us a clean cut glare into the crowd where the women are I'm sure they would have noticed that why? Not because I see them as something intimidating because of the respect I have for the females. Somebody's wife, somebody's sister, somebody's daughter, it could have been mine. Imagine someone stares at a face that is glaring from somewhere and the speaker's just looking at this person and they go home and say, he looked at me, he looked at me. You defeat the whole purpose of the talk. Why are we here today? You defeat the whole purpose. I lose respect and people start beginning to spread rumors and so on. And we are supposed to be speaking of spirituality. So powerful question. I hope what I've said has just helped. But I'd like you to go deeper and research because I cannot do justice in just a few minutes uh, to what you've asked. I've only tried to give you part of the answer. And I hope that the uh, you know, gathering would appreciate what I've just said. Barakallah. Thank you, sir. Um, Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salaam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I just revert to Islam a month back due to some circumstances. I need to visit my family. They are Christian. Um, I want to know. I want to know if I can lie to them. Me being Muslim, and what's your advice on visiting my family, considering the hardship I might face? Because I just spoke to my mother, and she feels that I'm going. I'm co coming closer to Islam, and she wants me to bring to pastor because she say I'm losing my faith to our religion. I will have to celebrate Christmas, and I don't know how I will pray back home, as I would have to do it in secret. I fear that I will be strong enough, and I'm scared that I will turn my back toward Islam. I start off my sister by making a dua for you. May Allah make it easy for you. May Allah bless you and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide you to do that which is correct. Obviously, it's a question that is very contemporary. And to be honest, uh, your family is important. At the same time, the Quran speaks about you being kind to them. And the Quran instructs you to be kind to them, dutiful unto them, except when they instruct you to do something against the, the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you visit your family. If they want you to consume alcohol, you don't do that. If they want you to visit the pastor, you don't do that. If they want you to, for example, do something in transgression with Allah, you sit them down and you explain to them. To, to, to tell them that you're a Muslim is not a condition. So if you haven't told them you're a Muslim, it's it's not a condition that you have to, depending on your situation. If the situation requires that you don't tell them, then you may not tell them. I always believe it is ideal to let them know, let you know, let it uh, come out into the open and then deal with it. I believe that that's the best way. You know, even when it comes, sorry, on a totally different topic altogether, when it comes to our social matters in the home and some, you need to sometimes relate that hey, this has happened and then deal with it. It's better than keeping it, keeping it for years on end and then struggling to deal with it. They might get angry and upset. The anger has a period of time. It will last a while. Some families, in some cases, it lasts longer and some it lasts a little bit less. So if perhaps you release it to them and they say, look, we told you and we knew and we this and they're crying and I'm going to do this, they won't do that. You know, your mom says, I'm going to kill myself. I've had cases where mom says, I'm not going to eat until uh, you come back. And the person says, OK, fine. Well, four or five days later, mom is busy having burgers at McDonald's. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us, really. 
May Allah make it easy for your parents as well to understand that Islam is not a barbaric religion. Today, because of the forces that are uh, across the globe uh, attempting to distort the image of Islam, that's the reason why people are worried. The minute you, they find you inclining towards Islam, they think that you're coming home with some barbaric faith, not realizing that if you were to practice Islam in the home, you'd be a better child than a child who does not practice the deen. So the true Islam is actually an Islam with peace. Maybe you can seize the opportunity to speak to your parents, like, uh, like I said moments ago, without disclosing to them that you're a Muslim, you can seize the opportunity to talk to them and then release it to them at some point. But that release will have to come. They might be upset with you. It happened at the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. If you feel that they might harm you, then you don't need to say anything. But if you feel that they'll just get upset, they'll get angry, they'll, you know, that happens. Subhanallah, that happens in a lot of cases. That might result in them studying Islam and coming towards it. They'll ask you a lot of questions. But uh, at the end of the day, the decisions have to be made. Uh, and I thank you for having, you know, trusted my opinion. I hope that it would have helped, inshallah, uh, in, in, in a small way at least. My sister, we pray for you, really. And I hope that you have a good journey back home. And I hope that perhaps whatever you've chosen to do, you build the courage to actually let them know. And if you want to let them know the day you're leaving, no problem. And if you want to let them know the day you've arrived, no problem. And if you want to let them know before you've arrived, no problem. And if you want to hold back for a little while due to circumstances you know best, that's also no problem. But at the same time, inshallah, if they instruct you to do something against the command of Allah, stay away from that. May Allah make it easy for us. Look at Ibrahim alayhi salam. When they asked him to go to the festival, he actually said, I'm sick. Meaning, I'm, I'm sick of what you guys are doing. And he stayed home. So it's not very difficult for us to do that. Uh, although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would open a door for us if we keep on asking him, may Allah open doors for all of us. Ameen. Jazakallah khair, sister. Thank you. Barakallah fiqh. My name is Abdul Fattah. I'm a student. I have a question. Why is music haram? If it is haram, what is the punishment of listening to music? Jazakumullah khair. MashaAllah. Will you listen to what I tell you? Yes. MashaAllah. Okay. Uh, if you take a look at music, and I know there are very few scholars, you know, of late who are saying, no, there's nothing wrong and so on. But even those, and I want to clarify something to start with before we get to what the, the, my, my son has asked. The truth is, even if we look at some of the scholars who might have said that, okay, you know what, uh, music, there is certain, uh, you know, it's permissible. They are not talking about the beat of today. Today's beat is definitely excluded. There is no scholar on earth, Muslim scholar, that allows you to listen to Beyonce and Madonna and Michael Jackson and those. That is completely out because, number one, it's dirty, it's filthy. The lyrics are horrible, terrible. They encourage you to move your body and to shake your thing, as they say. May Allah forgive us, really. They move, you move your body, you are sexually hyped up. It moves you to a point and a peak where the dirtiness of this music industry has got to such a degree that the Christians and the Jews who are following are also saying it's prohibited, not just the Muslims. So it's a dirty industry. Ask those who are in it. It's filthy. When you hear about music, you hear about how to attract the opposite sex. And it's all about love and all about, you know, your emotions. And so at home, you're not happy when you go to work. You see someone you're working with and you're busy thinking, oh, the music fits exactly here and so on. Things are happening. People are tampering with our minds. Whereas we have the melody of the Quran, the melodious revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has given us something great and grand. We should not substitute the Quran with that. As for the punishment that a person may get, Wallahi, that's between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's up to Allah how he chooses to do what he does. But what I need to tell you and what we all need to know is Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. Indeed. If we've done anything wrong in our lives, we ask Allah's forgiveness and then we should not feel in our hearts that he's not forgiven me because that's also insulting Allah. If you've, if you've been genuine in the way you've asked Allah's forgiveness, then Allah's forgiven you and you can repeat that seeking of forgiveness as many times as you want, but don't doubt it. Don't doubt. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, your parents and us all. Amen. Thank you. There's a sister who wants to take Shahada uh, and she only speaks Urdu. Okay, uh, can she repeat after me, inshallah, the, the, the words of Shahada? I may not be able to repeat the words in the Urdu language. Uh, perhaps I will, I will be saying it in the English language thereafter or you can help her to say the words, inshallah. Sheikh, you want to take the Shahada? 
Is she ready to repeat after me? Yes. Yes. Ashhadu. Yes. Ashhadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa. Illa. Allah. Allah. Wa ashhadu. Wa ashhadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Can someone repeat in Urdu for her, inshallah? मैं गवाही देती हूँ मैं गवाही देती हूँ कि अल्लाह एक है अल्लाह एक है और आप मोहम्मद सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम आप मोहम्मद सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम अल्लाह के रसूल हैं अल्लाह के रसूल हैं माशाल्लाह बारक अल्लाह फिक तकबीर अल्लाहु अकबर अल्लाहु अकबर May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, my sister, and at the same time we repeat whatever we've said to the previous sister to you, inshallah, the sisters will guide you. And I'd like to spend a moment here to say something very, very important uh, for a global audience. And that is, my brothers and sisters, when people have reverted to Islam, it's our duty to embrace them. It's our duty to ensure that they, they are comfortable. It's our duty to ensure that when we, we are considering marriage or someone would like to get married, don't just block them to say this person is a revert and this person. No, no, no. They are our brothers and sisters in Islam. A lot of them are struggling to get married because they are the only reverts. And then here come some people and some parents who might say, no ways, I'm not keen and I'm not interested because they don't have a family background, they don't have this and that. Na'udhu Billah. It's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of the reverts that I know are more powerful in, in Islam uh, than those who were born Muslim. So remember this. And remember we have duties and obligations unto them in order to help them and guide them and make them feel comfortable. We have a bad habit sometimes. We attend even a function of this nature. And we don't greet each other. We are rude to each other. We, we really have no manners sometimes. We forget. And therefore, I'd like you to, to spend a moment, inshallah, to greet one another, to try and at least ask one another, you know, how are you and do you, where do you come from and so on. No need to ask questions that are embarrassing or questions that would put people in a corner. Like, you know, once there was an imam in a masjid, and I've done it several times, but there was once an imam in a masjid who made an announcement to say, each one should uh, greet the brother next to him and each one should ask them one or two questions. And uh, people came complaining to say, people are asking me, what's your business and how can I benefit from you? Allahu Akbar. You know, brother, what do you do? Hey, I need a discount, man. You know, that's not what it's all about. In fact, if we enter a shop where we don't know the owners, we will purchase it even if it's expensive. Why is it that when you know someone, you want a big discount? Give them money. Give them your halal sustenance, inshallah. You know, I've always told people back at home when we're living in non-Muslim countries, you enter a shop of a non-Muslim or a business, and mashallah, you pay the price and you walk out. But enter the shop of a Muslim, salamu alaikum. And the brother just says, oh no, another one asking for a discount. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us, really. That's not what we should be doing. So we should greet one another, inshallah, even this evening. Let's feel the love and the brotherhood, the sisterhood, inshallah, and talk to each other, perhaps get to know someone. You might be able to assist someone and don't abuse that. Abuse that meaning, say, did you hear? He said, help me, I need so many dirhams, mashallah. Uh, that's not what's supposed to be the case. So my sister, inshallah, these are just words of encouragement for us and our relationship with those who reverted to Islam. It's important for us to say this. Uh, may Allah bless us all. Shukran. Uh, my name is Hussein. I'm working as a marketing manager in Dubai. I want to know when the soul of the righteous person is taken out, it is mentioned in the hadith that it goes up through all the heavens, seven, six, five, till, till the top. And all the people welcome them. Who is he? Then the angel says, son of so and so. Correct. So oh, when does this happen? Is it after the questioner in the graveyard or I mean the sequence of events? The soul is taken out, then it, is there some waiting time? And then the body goes to the grave. After that, does it start? Is it before the questions or after the questions? According to, according to Jazakallah Khair, I've understood your question. The, according to the hadith which is muttafaq alayhi in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim, uh, this happens immediately. As a person dies, the soul shoots up. Shoot straight up. One, two, three. It's greeted by name. So the angels ask, who is this good person? And, and, and uh, immediately the response comes, Fulan ibn Fulan. Such and such a person, son of such and such a person. And this is why we say you're going to be known by the name of your father. So even if someone's you know, identity is hidden, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us. You, taught, you, you use the name of your dad. So what happens is th they will be told so and so, so and so. And they will know who the person is. Because the angels right now would know that they've taken the deeds of this person and that person and whatever else it is. And so that hadith in, in, which is muttafaq alayhi makes mention of it before the questioning. And then it states that the soul immediately returns. 
I don't know the time frame of it, and it immediately returns for the questioning in the grave. Wallahu alam. And like I said yesterday, we have to stop where the hadith stops, where it starts, we start, and these uh, uh, matters of the unseen, we have no capacity to respond further than revelation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all, and may I end with the dua. May Allah make us from amongst those whose souls go up as good souls. Amen. And uh, Surah Mulk, can it save from graveyard punishment if you read every... According, the... to, according to one of the narrations, the narration is, is there and according to you, you would read the Surah. But one thing we need to know is that there are certain ahadith which make mention of, you know, some of the Surahs, Al-Kahf and so on. It does not mean that my life is being led like a total stranger to Islam and just because I read Surah Mulk, I'm going to be saved. You know, one man, for example, he, uh, he said, well, is it true that on such and such a day, if a person dies, then, you know, they're going to be saved from this type of punishment of the grave and so on. So if I want to die, I'll just kill myself on that day. Na'udhu Billah. That is wrong. That is absurd, completely absurd. So we need to know that when it comes to recitation, it must be coupled with action and it must be coupled with obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's when it will benefit you. And also what is extremely beneficial, you know, the Quran has, has benefit from the beginning to the end. Every verse has some miraculous aspect to it. It's the word of Allah. It has in it so much of cure, so much of spirituality, so much of message and so on. So I would love to believe, and this is my own practice, that if you pick up the Quran and make sure that you read from cover to cover and you move with it as it is on a daily basis you have a certain amount of recitation such that you begin to cover the Quran on a regular basis the impact and the benefit will be far more than if you were to just read a specific surah for a specific reason and ignore the rest of the Quran Allah knows best Jazakumullah khair Assalamu alaikum Assalamu alaikum wa I have two questions I took shahada two weeks back Inshallah. And I have not told to my family yet, because as they told me, they will not accept me. Allah. And then the second question is how I'm going to Umrah without Maharam. Are you, are you going or you want to go? I want to go. You want to go, okay. Um, firstly, my dear sister, the first part of the question is very similar to the other sister who asked a similar question connected to the family. It's very difficult and this is why we say some people who've reverted are found in a catch-22 because neither do people like us embrace them sometimes and wallahi it's, it's something I've repeated today and I'm saying it again, nor do their families embrace them. So what, are they, what do they have as an option? This is why we say, my brothers and sisters, Wallahi, we have a duty unto our brothers and sisters who have reverted. If we are miserly in terms of fulfilling that duty, we are answerable to Allah. It could just be our Jannah. You know, the Hadith speaks of how to, if Allah has used you to guide one person, for you will be meaning it's better for you than whatever the earth has to offer in terms of high material value items. You know, the hadith uses the term humur in na'am. It's better than the red camel, the most expensive of the material items available. But it's not good enough to just revert someone and forget about them and go. Follow it through with them. Follow it through. Help them. Teach them. Guide them. And inshallah, in this way, they will be able to achieve. As for the umrah, subhanallah, look, I will only tell you what is the happening. Uh, if, according to Imam Shafi and according to some of the scholars, if it is a journey that's important and so on, and you are moving in a, in a group of uh, respectable women, then it is permitted. I don't know what the, the embassy would do here and whether they would issue you a visa or not. But if you don't have a mahram, then subhanallah, you may want to delay that trip until inshallah you do have a mahram, and that's according to the bulk of the scholars. But I do know of certain uh, groups, I do know of certain groups that I have met when I was in Mecca and Medina Munawwara, uh, who have told me that from this country, they do, have, uh, they do have trips that are made, which are guided and protected in groups, in larger groups, where they would cater for someone like you. May Allah make it easy for us all. Wallahu a'lam. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Taha. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant working in, uh, in order from here. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm planning to get uh, married inshallah in a few months, uh, so my uh, to-be wife, she wants to like uh, do a job uh, when uh, after marriage, so she can help uh, in earning the bread. So how is it from an Islamic point of view, 
knowing that it's my responsibility to earn the bread for the household and it would put undue burden on her uh, in addition to her house uh, responsibilities within the house. So should I encourage and facilitate her and uh, what's the point of view on that? Jazakumullah khair. My brother, if the job is Sharia compliant and she is not compromising her religion where she is working in terms of the rules and regulations of how a female should work, then it is not prohibited for her to work. She may work. And whether she works or not is something that should be mutually agreed upon. So if you agree and, and you don't mind and she doesn't mind and then uh, she works uh, within a, an environment that is okay for a female to work in, then a Alhamdulillah, there is no harm. She may do that. In fact, sometimes I know of some housewives who've come uh, to countries of this nature who get very, very bored. And then they think up of, you know, maybe kindergarten, maybe teaching, maybe something else in, in a good environment uh, in order also to, 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 to be serving humanity and at the same time to protect themselves from boredom and perhaps to earn something. And as you know, life is extremely expensive. I know of some of the Western countries where every member of the family has to work, otherwise they won't survive. And so uh, the, the question now is where exactly uh, she works that's something inshallah you guys need to look into and you need to make sure that it's not a place where you're going to lose your marriage because sometimes if there's just one woman working in amongst all the men and so on uh, you know it could be we've known of many cases where people have sometimes lost their their marriages because small thing goes wrong in the home and who's there to confide in besides other males may Allah bless us all protect us uh, like I've said it's not wrong for a female to work at all uh, but it's something mutually uh, agreed upon inshallah and the environment should be correct wallahu alam Thank you. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, with the mercy of Allah, I started learning the meanings of Quran from which I understood the purpose of life. So I started practicing my life according to Sharia and Sunnah. Uh, and also, I have full support from my husband and my kids. But uh, my immediate family are saying this is extreme. And Islam teaches us to be moderate. So, on the other hand, Hukukul Ibad is also important. So I limited my communication with them, but I don't want to lose them because I, I, ha I love them and I respect them even more uh, after knowing Quran. So please can you guide me how to balance and uh, on the other hand I have to teach my kids also about the Hukukul Ibad and Hukukul Allah and I can't compromise my Akhirah to please them. My sister, mashallah, you, you are a married woman, it seems, or you have children, at least, it seems. May Allah bless them all. You have duties Amen. unto your children as well. Yes. Uh, what I'd like to say is you don't have to cut communication with your folks just because they are saying that you might be extreme. Perhaps you'd like to engage them in beautiful discussion. Perhaps you'd like to remind them in so, uh, about something. You know, uh, I found it beneficial sometimes, you know, to go out and help them when they have a function, to go out and perhaps cook a meal for them, invite them over for a meal. And uh, initially, don't even discuss faith and uh, perhaps inshallah their hearts will soften up call out to Allah make a lot of dua to Allah to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to to soften their hearts and to guide you to the most beautiful way of talking to them because it's all about communication if you can talk to someone uh, in a beautiful way you will convince them without even you having tried to be honest it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but with us we will try and we will still call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so uh, I would suggest that you don't cut them out completely and you, you don't even have to minimize unless unless they are having an influence on you whereby they are making your habits become bad once again so look at yourself how you talk to them the respect of them and inshallah in that way you will be able to benefit them much more uh, are we allowed the nikah where uh, like in india we have the concept of mixed gatherings dance and music and all as the functions before the nikah so as a, their immediate relatives are we allowed to attend all those functions my sister, if uh, the function of nikah has, you know, is a sacred function and if there is something haram happening there, then you can excuse yourself. I have done it so many times. I've excused myself from functions because I felt that it would damage my own level. Perhaps I may be going there and I don't want to be bumping into, you know, uh, women or to bumping into... Uh, things that are terrible and bad, you know, alcohol is being drunk there and sometimes music is being blasted in the ears. You know, if you're walking through a mall and you have something to do in the mall or you're walking through a place and someone's blasting the music and so on, it's one of those things. But for us to, to go and attend a function where a lot of haram is happening, it's actually our right and our freedom not to go. Uh, you know, just like sometimes if you were to invite the Hindus to your home, you, you need to be conscious of what they believe as well. So don't insult them by putting things that will 
will actually be insulting to them uh, on the table and so on. You need to respect what they believe with disagreement. You might disagree, they disagree, but you respect that they are allowed to do what they're doing and so are you. So the same would apply to other Muslims. Sometimes if they're doing something that we believe is, is unacceptable, then they should understand that, look, uh, uh, this is unacceptable, but say it in a beautiful way. The problem with us sometimes, and I'm not saying yourself, I'm saying perhaps even myself at a certain stage, and maybe uh, a lot of us would benefit from this little piece that I'm about to say. The problem is, when we turn to religion a little bit, we become a bit aggressive. And we think that, you know what, uh, the way I talk to someone is, is such that I'm holier than you and that's it. I'm not coming. There's haram happening in that function. Relax. There's a way of talking. Say, no, mashallah, I'd love to come. Here's a gift. You know, go to them a day, a day ahead, their family. Go and spend a little bit of time. Go and give them your gift and thank them. Make a lot of dua. And, you know, say something to them. You know, I may not be able to attend. But, you know, that's it. I'll try my best. But X, Y, and Z. I recall a function that I was invited to and I was told clearly that this function is completely separated. You see, if they tell you in advance what's going on, it's one of those things. And when I got there, I saw it totally mixed. So on grounds of principle of being lied to, I actually told him, Salaamu Alaikum, and I'm departing. And I departed. And I told the brother who had invited me, look, my brother, I love you so much. I pray for you. Allah grant you success. And I hope, I wish all the best for you. But you know what? You actually deceived me. You told me that it's not going to be like this, and it is like this. He said, no, no, but you know this, and you know that. And I said, look, my brother, I really, I'm not saying it because I don't like you. I love you. But I won't be able to be there. And, and the reality is you should have told me in advance. You made me travel all the way. You made me come all the way here. And this is what I found. So this, I'm just telling you, I've done it. And whether people liked you for that or not is one of those things. It's one of those things. And there have been times when you have to, uh, sometimes you're caught in a certain spot where you may have to greet someone of the opposite sex. You may have to interact with them, but that interaction should be limited to whatever is necessary. And, you know, it shouldn't go into that which is flirting and so on and so forth. May Allah protect us all. We're living in a, in, in a world where, yes, we're going through a lot of difficulty. I've interacted with so many females, whether it's in the bank or the aircraft or anywhere else, sometimes on the street, sometimes passing in a passage and so on, and people greet you. They, they, it's our right to actually greet back. Subhanallah, you have to. And sometimes you have to greet because you know what? That's, you are the Muslim that's there. I've known of cases where uh, women have been stuck uh, with their motor vehicles on the roads and I have actually stopped in order to help and assist and they were just women and me and, and that was it and I felt that it's better that I stop and assist these Muslim women than someone whom we don't know stops and assist them subhanallah and you do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the point I'm raising is as we get closer to Allah let's not let it affect our character negatively when we talk to others be calm with them try and explain to them it took us 20 years sometimes to see the light it might take them 40 years we can't expect them to come in five minutes, ten minutes. If you don't see the light, that's it. You're astray. Make dua and keep on trying. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair. Please make dua May for Allah my sons. May Allah bless you and bless Muhammad us all. Muhammad Anas and Muhammad Hamza. I mean, barakallah fiqh. Allah bless them and bless us all and all our children and those who don't have children. May Allah grant you children who will be the coolness of your eyes and those who are not married yet. May Allah grant you spouses who will be the coolness of your eyes. Ameen. Ameen. Wow, I heard that quite loud. Masha'a Ameen. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Ameen. Ameen. Yes, Habibi. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. Uh, my name is Tamer. I work in uh, sales and marketing. I would like to know, um, there's a group of brothers basically. They live quite far away from a mosque, more than one hour and a half. Uh, about five of them. They want to know what's the ruling for uh, Salatul Jumu'ah. Should they, should they go to the mosque? If it's, uh, they actually, they live outside of a Muslim country, so they're in work on this time. And they're far away from the mosque. So they want to know, should they go? Or should they pray in the office? Okay, let me just get you right. Yes. They live in a non-Muslim country, correct? Yes. yes. They live one and a half hours away from the nearest masjid. Yeah, they, they work that far away. Yes. They work that. So the time of Jum'ah, they are unable to come to the masjid. And how many of them are there in number? They said five and above. And would they be able to gather, uh, the, the, you know, a few more people who might be living around somewhere? Because I tell you what, it's if I were to just say, okay, do your Jumu'ah, uh, we may be defeating the purpose of the entire Jumu'ah. Although some scholars might allow it. I know Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi alayhi, three and above, he's allowed. Uh, Imam Shafi'i is a little bit stricter in that. And these are rules of jurisprudence. But we need to look into the situation to make sure we maximize and we benefit. Perhaps if, and maybe perhaps if, 
we would be able to try and see uh, the, the, some a few other Muslims, and it's not so difficult nowadays with the internet, you know, to try and uh, motivate and encourage people. Look, if there are any Muslims here, we're planning on having a Jum'ah uh, here so that we we can save our time going back and come. Sometimes they cannot. So in that particular case, inshallah, if they start it with the intention of gathering a few more people, Bismillah, let them go for it, and they will be able to read the Jum'ah. But if they're just doing it in order to break away from the masjid and in order to to have their own little thing and making no effort to gather the rest of the Muslimin, then jama'a means to gather. You know, we're bringing the people together. So inshallah, if they would like to gather, alhamdulillah, let's go for it. And inshallah, you can send me an email. Perhaps I can even assist in that regard, inshallah. Barakallah fi. Wallahu a'lam. Can a man correct his Muslim women colleagues on their appearance and their on for following pro proper ruling of Islam? For example, a man corrects a woman that her lipstick is too much. MashaAllah. My sister, what was he doing looking at that lipstick? MashaAllah. <laughs> Uh, the reality is, if politely he reminds a Muslim sister, I don't think to say your lipstick is too much is actually respectful. To be honest with you, if I saw a sister, you know, full makeup and whatever, the first thing I would do, inshallah, inshallah, I hope Allah strengthens me to just look down, you know. And uh, I'm being as realistic as possible, my brothers. You know, I'm trying to word it respectfully. Don't think that I'm a person who's not a human being. I'm just like you. So inshallah, I try my best to look down and I wouldn't embarrass that sister in that, in that condition. Not at all. It's the wrong time and place. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> La A'udhu Billah. You know, Wallahi, what are you doing? You know, the woman will start hating religious people. What are these guys all about? No way. You get an opportunity. You find the right moment. You show them that you care for them as a Muslim sister. And she's not just an object. And slowly but surely, Wallahi, sometimes without speaking, it will start improving itself because they will realize that, hey, you know what, hang on. I am not created by Allah to attract the opposite sex. And to be honest, I've spoken to non-Muslim women sometimes when the opportunity has arisen. And a lot of them feel, no, it's, it's, I feel good. Good when all the men look at me, I get angry when a man don't look at me, man. You know, it happened to me once. We were in an airport in one of the European countries, and I walked away, I walked past, and there was this woman who was literally dressed to kill, you know. And subhanallah, by the help of Allah, and I'm I'm relating it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we are human beings, I didn't even look, it didn't even tickle me. And she actually came up to me a little while later and say, why didn't you look? And I'm like, Astaghfirullah, now you want me to look, basically, you know. <laughs> and I said, no, sister, I respect you so much that I'd, I'd appreciate, you know, and so on. And this has happened to me not a long time ago. And it's happened to other scholars in the past. And I've mentioned this in some of my, my, my lectures as well. So I think to correct a sister, there is a way, you know, a respectful way, a dignified way. But it is a duty to do something about it. You know, when you see something bad, you have to correct it. So when you correct it, you correct it on different levels, but you are never harsh. The Prophet ﷺ was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It is because of the mercy of Allah that you are lenient towards them. Had you been harsh and hard-hearted towards them, they would have dispersed. Wallahi, the same rule applies. You see a Muslim and every one of us, myself included, we need correction. Imagine if someone comes to you and just starts telling you things and you know you're an idiot and you're useless and what you said and what you did and how you operate. You won't appreciate it because that's the nature of man. But if you want to correct someone, brother, mashallah, tabarakallah, you know, so on. And if it's a sister, you don't need to get into all that detail. But at least you need to show concern. Uh, sometimes when Muslims have Muslim colleagues who are of the opposite sex, they prefer to talk to non-Muslims than their own Muslims, you know, and this is something that beats me. I don't understand what's the logic behind it. I'm not saying you shouldn't be communicating with any of your colleagues, Muslim or non-Muslim, but I'm saying the poor sister is firstly a Muslim. Perhaps she looks up to you. I know of Muslim sisters who've been motivated at workplace just because their male colleagues never miss a salah. And the sister says, I had a male colleague who never ever missed his salah. And I was so embarrassed because I just used to sit through the lunch and do nothing. And then I started, I said to myself, if he does it, let me do it. And there was no communication. It was just looking. So this is why we say, subhanallah, there is a way of doing things. So uh, it is a duty of anyone, either one, to correct the other. But with respect and with, with wisdom. You know, we heard the verse beautifully recited earlier on. Udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. When you are calling towards the path of Allah, call with wisdom. Don't call with... Uh, 
uh, you know, the, the first thing that comes to your head, sit, think about it, make dua to Allah about it, ask Allah's guidance about it, then do something. You might want to send a beautiful email. And you know, when you send an email, there's a way of doing things. Because if you just send an email to the same sister who's working with you and say, sister, uh, like the sister just said, you, 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 wear, you wear too much lipstick at, at work and that is haram as it is lipstick is red and the color of Jahannam is also red. <laughs> come on, come on. There's a way of talking. So you say, sister, mashallah, may Allah strengthen you, may Allah help you, may Allah bless you and your loved ones. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you goodness and greatness. I've got so many weaknesses of my own. Please highlight them if you see them. Please do not feel bad that I'm highlighting to you something minor that I believe, you know, it was, if it wasn't my duty as a Muslim, I wouldn't even have bothered. But I felt very, very slightly that I should perhaps let you know. And as I say, before I let you know, if there's anything that you see in me that needs attention, please let me know. And the, the point that I wanted to raise was, you know, perhaps if you'd like to consider uh, or, or reconsider the way you wear your makeup. Allahu Akbar, I'm trying to word it carefully. This is just an example based on what the sister is saying. Or it is much more palatable. A person will take it, they'd say, Jazakumullah khair, I appreciate, make dua for me, I thank you, because of how you said it. This goes back to the way you talk. May Allah grant us goodness and wisdom, but it is our duty to correct one another. Wallahu a'lam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Ashwaq Ahmad. I work in a purchase department in a hospital. My question, I have two questions, Sheikh, but seeing the line behind, I doubt whether I'll get the second chance. Can I ask the two questions? If the organizers allow me. If you, are, you want to ask the two questions, not the organizers, each one in the row has a right <laughs> okay, to that question. Okay, I'll go one question, inshallah. Uh, my first question is to how to get the khushu in the salah. Because the moment you say Allahu Akbar, the shaitan comes Allah. into it and start reminding us of all the things which we have missed and which we are supposed to do. And the best part is the moment we finish the salah, we'll forget what we just did at this thing. So how do we get in khushu in the salah? Habibi, mashallah, what a beautiful question. Jazakumullah khair. Really, it reminds me of the brother that asked a question about women and so on. I've had youngsters who say every time I say Allahu Akbar, you know, my honey just comes in my head, you know, and I just busy, oh, when will I see her and what will I do? And astaghfirullah. That's shaitan that's just got hold of us. So what do you do? Number one, you ask Allah's guidance. That's always there. It's Allah. It's Allah who grants it. But you take a look at the excess items we do on a daily basis. Try and cut them out. So if you lower your gaze, the chances of you concentrating in salah are far more. And if, for example, you, and I'm not saying if you don't, if you lower your gaze, you will be able to concentrate because there are other factors as well. But it's one point. Another thing is, if you have too many things that you're doing in life, your concentration in salah will be less because it's, uh, your, your day is filled without any order. And you're thinking of so many things, you're not calm, you're not collected, you haven't written down things sometimes. And you've got to think of so many things and you're worried. Let me give you an example. If you have 20 things to do and you've written them on a piece of paper, your mind has less in it because you know you'll refer to the paper and you tick it off. But when you haven't and you're relying on your brain, and this is an honest example, 20 things are there. When you start salah, you're remembering the 20 things I need to do. And then you're starting to say, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, and so on. And I'm busy thinking my 20 things. As soon as I'm finished my salah, hey, these 20 things here. And I start checking, what's it, what's it? So what have I done? I've increased in my mind, put in something that I could have just put on a piece of paper and held, held it. A lot of us don't have a piece of paper. We just want to remember things. So there's no barakah in our day. I'm not saying you have to have a piece of paper. But today you have technology. You can, you know, put it onto your phone. You can put it, you can delegate it. It's like a man who has a business and his business has grown and he wants to be the head of every department. His business will come crashing. You have to delegate. You have to start uh, developing it in such a way that you have a head of department who will do the small worries of every day. They will handle you. They report to you. If there's something big, you can handle it because now you're the CEO. But the problem with us is we want to handle every aspect of everything. Then when we get to salah, no concentration. So number one, to remove a lot of, to call out to Allah, to ask Allah, to remove a lot of the excess thoughts and excess baggage that perhaps we have. Then what we also need to know is uh, to increase the understanding of the Quran so that when you are reading salah, uh, or fulfilling the salah, uh, whatever you are saying, you know the meaning of it. The minute that happens, you, the chances of you dwindling in terms of concentration minimizes. 
Because I know when I say Allahu Akbar, I enjoy that. Oh, my maker is the greatest. The worshipped one is the greatest. He is definitely the greatest. And then I'm saying Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik or any other dua, Allahumma ba'id bayni wa bayna khatayai or wajjahtu wajhiya lilladhi fatara samawati wal ard. Whatever, whatever you're reading and then your Surah Al-Fatiha and I'm concentrating on the meaning and I know a lot about it. So increase your knowledge of what is being recited in Salah and fulfilled. By the will of Allah, it will help you a lot. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. I've mentioned three or four points. There are a lot of other pointers that perhaps you would get. And I'm so happy that you've asked because it's actually revived uh, my own commitment to concentration in Salah. It happens to all of us. You know, you've got to catch a flight and you, Allahu Akbar, and you wonder, wonder what the time is, you know, wonder what the time is, you know. I recall once I was the Imam uh, at, at an airport and uh, I, I led the Salah and I have a habit that when you are an Imam at the airport, make the shortest possible Salah. The reason is people are catching a flight at the back. And so I made a very short Salah and I was sitting after that and there was a certain brother who spoke to me and he said, you know, I was in such and such an airport and there was one Imam and he started leading Salah and he was leading so long that one by one the people started walking away. You know, <laughs> because what happened is I have a flight to catch. This guy is reading a long surah. He just looks at his clock and he's gone. Astaghfirullah. So you need to know, even when there is an imam and all those who may be imams, think very carefully. It's better to have a shorter salah with concentration than to go on and on and on. I remember the first time when I was in Medina Munawwara and uh, we had Salatul Kusuf. You know, the Salah of the Eclipse. And the Imam was reading Surah Al-Baqarah. And he started, and he was going on and on. MashaAllah. And you know what? And then he says, Allahu Akbar. He says, Sami Allahu Liman Hamidah. And he's reading, he's reading again. And he goes on and on. And the people who joined were not expecting that. So I remember clearly in front of me, there was a man, a boy, a youngster, who picked out his bottle of water, opened it and had a sip, and he put it back. And I'm busy thinking, does this guy know what he did? And you know, after Salah, I told him, I said, you drank water. He said, no, I didn't. <laughs> I, I, he said, this shows concentration, no concentration because it's prolonged. And I said, I swear you drank water. Do you have water in your, in your pocket? He said, yes, I do. I said, look at it. He looked at it and it was half. <laughs> he said, hey, when did I drink the water? <laughs> So that's the thing. So may Allah help us to, 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 to increase, inshallah, our concentration in salah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all, really. And this is why we always tell the imams, you know, like I just said. Allah, wallahu a'lam. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah Barakallah I think uh, we can take a few more questions, inshallah. I, you know, I see the whole queue there, but Allah has blessed you and Allah will grant you goodness. Standing in the queue is not a waste of time. It's actually uh, you earning the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if you don't make it to the front, by the will of Allah, you'll find solutions to your issues because you are really concerned about them. So even the sisters and the brothers, we might have to minimize. I haven't yet said how many, but inshallah, perhaps two or three more inshallah. Yes, uh, bismillah. Uh, are we taking it from the, the sisters? Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My husband's grandmother passed away yesterday and he left for India for the purpose. For at least some months, the emotions within the family will run very high and the relatives will advise about acts of worship that will benefit the departed soul. So I just want to ask you that what are the deeds that the immediate family and the extended family should be doing that will be accepted by Allah during this emotional time? MashaAllah, beautiful question, very important and pertinent. We need to go back to the hadith of Rasulullah uh, regarding when a person when a human being passes away his deeds are actually cut off except from three uh, one of them is uh, knowledge that the person has disseminated it will continue inshallah as much as the people continue learning uh, and the fruits continue being reaped at the same time uh, also the, the hadith makes mention of a sadaqatun jariya which means an act of worship uh, an act of charity that the person engaged in which would be uh, continuous so something that the benefit of it continues after the person's life they would continue getting the reward for it and at the same time waladun salihun yad'u which means uh, a pious child making dua for uh, that deceased person from the sunnah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam we've heard him making dua li jami'i mawt al muslimin for 
all the, the, those who've passed away from the ummah. So to make dua is perhaps the most powerful gift you could ever give any deceased person. If I were to die, I would actually want people to ask Allah to forgive me and to grant me Jannah. That would be the biggest thing you could ever do. And continue to make the dua and make it again and again and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, if the person has had a debt, it would help if you were to contribute towards you know, finishing up the debt. If the person was supposed to fulfill for some reason they couldn't, it would benefit if you perhaps would fulfill that particular hajj by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So like I said, uh, s some people engage in so many things, they believe that after three days you need to gather, and after 10 days perhaps you need to gather, and after perhaps 40 days you need to gather. We don't find that in the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so we'd prefer to do that which is authentic and which is more beneficial. Even if shaitan comes to us and makes us feel for a moment that you know what? Um, uh, what you've done is very little, it's very light. Why don't you, you know, you do something much more. But to be honest, it's light and it's easy, but that's the most beneficial thing. It doesn't mean that because gold is right here and it's easy for me to get, that I must go and dig the stones from out there. The gold is right here, let me collect it. Mashallah, that's Allah. So Allah's made it easy for us. Also, what I'd want to encourage uh, and spend a moment to encourage us all. Don't wait for, you, for, your, for yourself to die and then hope that someone after you is going to do something. You know, some people sometimes uh, they build a waqf and they say, okay, this is a masjid. Uh, inshallah, the name of my, my parents, may Allah grant them Jannah and so on. Do things in your life, in your life, read your Quran, fulfill your Hajj, you know, make sure your debts are all paid up and make sure whatever's happened, you know, your good, your charities, knowledge, you disseminate in a beautiful way. And inshallah, that will help much more than if someone else uh, were to come later on and do something claiming that, okay, this is on your behalf. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and may he guide us in this regard. Uh, Jazakumullah khair, shukran for that question, my sister, and I hope the answer has helped. Jazakumullah khair. Yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. My name is Yasin and I have a question. MashaAllah. Why did Allah create life as a test? MashaAllah. Jazakumullah khair. Why did Allah create life as a test? Is that your question? Yes. Beautiful question. Uh, after every test, we have prize giving, right? Yes. When you have tests at school, don't they tell you who's first, second, and third? Do they tell you that? Yes. They do. And the person who comes first and second and third for the whole year, at the end of the year you have a prize giving and who goes on the stage? Those who pass the test, isn't it? And what do they get? A prize. Am I right? Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared a beautiful prize for us and that is Jannah, it's eternal. We will be living in a life where there is no death and we will be getting whatever we want. Would you like to get whatever you wish for? And, some, and it's given to you. Would you like that? Yes. You would like it, isn't it? So in order to get to that stage, we need to just answer a few questions here. Allah might say, okay, uh, you might not have so much wealth. What are you going to do? So then we've got to lead our lives in a way that pleases Allah because a day will come when we'll have everything, inshallah. You, someone might get sick. May Allah grant us all cure. We need to understand that if this is the case, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give me something inshallah. Without a test, you're not going to get that Jannah. You're not going to get that paradise. So we ask Allah to make it easy, but that's Allah. He has made this life as a test in order to give us something that is eternal as a result. And that's Allah's plan. I hope you've understood what I've said. Yes. Is it okay? Yes. You want me to add a bit more? Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Sir. MashaAllah. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you I so have much. something else as well. Is it a question? No. Okay. A little bit. Please make dua that inshallah I become a sheikh or an imam similar to you. I make a dua that inshallah you become a sheikh and an imam, but not similar to me, better than me, inshallah. Say Amin. Amen. 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 May Allah bless you and grant you, you know, elevation such that you, I am a nobody. Trust me, I may, perhaps, you know, we try our best, but you aim at the Sahaba. Those are the ones you aim at. Those are the true heroes. You know, you aim very high. So inshallah, at least we get somewhere, inshallah. So to aim at me is very low. I'm still on earth. Aim at those, subhanAllah, high, very high. He, superheroes. Learn about them. See what they did. See how they spoke. See what happened. See how they worked in this world. How they passed the same tests you were asking about. And how they looked at it. And inshallah, you will achieve much more than a person like me. May Allah help you and help us all. Jazakumullah khair.
Uh, just before that question, I'd just like to encourage again, if there are any non-Muslims in the audience who would like to pose a question, we're giving you preference, inshallah, done as well. Inshallah. I think uh, perhaps if we can uh, it, it, taper it to one more question each from the sisters and, and, and the brothers, inshallah. Uh, perhaps th that's just for, for purposes of me and my, uh, what can I say? May Allah bless us all. Okay. Just from me, inshallah. Yes. Uh, the, the sister, I think. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Inshal and I'm a student of grade 5. My question is, in peace conference, this peace conference, you said that everyone needs peace, but shaitan and lots of people like, like Israel don't need peace at all. Well, because if they would need peace, they would, why would they why would they harm harmful deeds, especially to Muslims, even fellow Muslims? What to do with these people? Because if we guide them, they turn a deaf ear to our advice. Okay, Jazakumullah khair. I don't know if it was me who said that, but someone else may have said that, and I'm not too sure. Uh, but from what I've understood of what you've asked is about Islam being a religion of peace and why some people perhaps do not promote peace. Well, look, we need to constantly remain focused on the fact that Islam means peace. And uh, you and I know, we all know that in order to maintain peace, uh, if there is a criminal element in our midst, we need to make an example of them so that no one else does that and everyone else is secure. Say, for example, uh, someone does something really, really bad and they, 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 slap, they slap you across your face in full view of the public. And uh, this is at school, for example. Uh, you would have complained to the headmaster and the headmaster might call them and punish them. That does not make the school or the headmaster a person who doesn't like peace. In fact, it makes the person really love peace because obviously they don't want that to repeat itself. So uh, from that perspective, yes, in Islam, we, we promote peace. We will ensure that peace prevails as best as we can. But shaitan comes to make us lose focus. So. For example, we get agitated and irritated with what this person is doing, yet there's a beautiful way of dealing with it and we're too impatient. So we want to deal with it in a way that I need to see results today. And because of that, we begin to become violent. We sometimes do things that are un-Islamic and we give a bad picture of Islam uh, to others because they think Islam is a violent religion because they see how we're dressed and they see, oh, I've got a beard or I'm wearing a scarf and so on. So uh, we, we need to educate ourselves and be patient. We need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help and guidance. Uh, I, I hope I've understood what you've said because that's what I understood. Uh, that Islam is a religion of peace, but sometimes some people don't promote it. Well, that's their, that's their weakness, isn't it? And it does not change Islam. It does not uh, change the core values of Islam, but it definitely does give a bad picture uh, of Islam to people who might not know much about it. So it's our duty, peaceful people like myself and yourselves, to, you know, to continue to try and promote justice and peace as best as we can. It's become more and more difficult on, on, on the globe, but, but the, the winner is he who can keep on trying and not lose focus. Wallahu alam. Allah knows best. Jazakumullah khair. And if they don't listen, what do we do? Well, we keep on trying, inshallah. And uh, if, if those people are under our authority, then we might want to talk to them, uh, inshallah, in a more convincing way. But if, for example, they happen to be people who are distant, you know, there are so many people across the globe who disagree with us because they have chosen some other faith or they have chosen another way. We don't trample on their toes and they should not trample on our toes. That's how it is. And this is the principle that we have. Uh, yes, we convey the message. We share with them the message. We will continue to engage with them in terms of propagation. And, and they will also probably propagate to us. I mean, I know of so many people who are non-Muslim who have told me that they've propagated their faith to so many Muslims in other lands. And it's up to the, the, the Muslim to have polished up his knowledge of Islam or her knowledge of Islam in a way that he or she would be able to 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 educate the person who's trying to deviate them from Islam a lot of people have tried to convince people to leave Islam and they've ended up becoming closer to Islam than they ever were and perhaps turning to Islam yet their intention was to turn others away from it so all this has to do with our duty of conveying and keep on trying so if they don't listen we keep on trying and inshallah uh, we, we we will not lose hope in the mercy of Allah and in his ability to grant solution to all of us. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My name is Abdul Hasib. I'm working as an electrical engineer. Um, my question is, my father-in-law uh, father used to work as a banker. He worked for about like 30 years. Uh, then when he got to know about like it's haram, he resigned. But he got the benefit from it and uh, like the house and the car and everything, like can he avail it? And w what is the ruling on my wife and my brother-in-law? Can they avail it uh, as well? There are two views there uh, completely and uh, I incline towards the view that if the man has asked Allah's forgiveness and so on then that wealth he has had he may use whatever he's got up to now and by the will of Allah from the cut-off date where he's asked Allah's forgiveness really and sincerely we're not talking of someone who said okay one day we'll ask for forgiveness in this case it sounds very genuine that you know so inshallah whatever has passed may Allah forgive it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant goodness and we hope that from that day on it, it will actually uh, you know the sustenance that does come in will not be of a similar nature. Wallahu alam. So don't issue rulings to say, I'm not going to go to the house and I don't want to do this. The men have made tawbah, the people have turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and alhamdulillah. Uh, also we have a ruling in the sharia, al-malu idha tabadal al-aydi tahur. You know, wealth, when it changes hands, it becomes pure. Like for example, uh, a person might have earned uh, wealth through haram means say, let me give you one example. You have a superet or a supermarket or a little shop and someone walks into your shop and they might have, Allah forgive us, I'm going to give you just any example of something dirty. Say for example, a prostitute who's earned money through haram, right? And she comes to buy water and milk and something from your shop. It is not your duty to ask her, hey, fill in this form, where did you get your money? The fact that money is being exchanged for something halal, it makes it permissible for you to eat that money. So she, like for example, someone comes to you and they have, rented your house and uh, they happen to be non-muslim they are paying you for the house but in that house for example uh, they will definitely because they're non-muslim be doing certain things that are un-islamic that rental some people say no it's haram you can't ha it is halal there's nothing wrong with it because they are paying you for the rental the only time you need to worry is when they put up a big board to convert it into a nightclub or something then you can want to terminate your contract with them because you don't want to be seen to be encouraging that but if a person has uh, you know I recall one day I went with one landlord to one place and we went entered the home and he went to collect the rentals and I happened to be a kid with him and there were beer bottles there and I just looked and I said and I was a young kid as we grew older we realized those were not even Muslims and the person collected his rent May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us and forgive us. Uh, I hope I've answered. Like I said, there are two opinions. You will get some others who might say, you know, do this and do that. I incline towards uh, the next one because when you engage in tawbah and you ask Allah's forgiveness, Allah will forgive you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and there are also various other reasons that I've said this. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant us goodness and may he accept it from us. Wallahu alam. Allah knows best. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. That was the last question, inshallah, from the brothers. Uh, the sisters, inshallah, the last question. What is the ruling on joint family in Islam? How to balance between each relation? Sorry, uh, can you explain that? Joint family? What is the ruling on joint family in Islam? How to balance between each relation? Joint family, Habibi? What is the ruling you mean, on to, you mean to live together with your in-laws and so on? Is that, is that the understanding? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Okay, no, shukran. Sorry, I didn't uh, get that first. So the question is, what is the ruling on living together as an extended family and what, are the, what is the extent of it? Uh, that's obviously, it de it's dependent on a lot of factors. Uh, it's not haram, it's permissible on condition that uh, the rules of hijab are not, you know, disregarded. And at the same time, there is respect and modesty in the home. And that respect is very important because, you know, if there are two brothers who are married and the one brother issues instruction to the other brother's wife, that's wrong. That's wrong. You know, you need to have that respect and the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us. Similarly, you have adult children and each one bullies the other. So if you have a beautiful home with, you know, a strong ethos and with, with strong, for example, uh, Islamic inclination or moral values and so on, it can work. But I'd like to believe in today's world. There is a lot of selfishness that takes over people. And even if we are good, sometimes not everyone that we are living with is good. So if, for example, there is uh, a discrepancy and people are finding it difficult, rather than making it something depressing where everybody is fighting each other and people are angry and depressed, we'd rather separate. 
We'd rather live separately and we'd rather try. Some people's financial circumstances do not allow that to happen. But to draw the line is important because like we say in Islam, when a man gets married, his wife is not his father's wife. Some people in some cultures, the father decides, <laughs> this happens a lot, the father decides who you're going to marry and after that he instructs the woman also to say you do this, you do that, you do that. So she's just an unpaid maid for the home. And subhanallah, that's, you know, some people don't mind, you know, do, serving. But to be honest with you, there is a limit to it. If, if they're disrespected and just treated like a slave and everyone comes and dish instruction, then that's not right. That Islamically, the woman deserves her dignity and her respect and she deserves her level and she, she obviously deserves her privacy as well. And if she wants to uh, forego that, if she wants to, you know, for example, that's her right. If she would like to overlook it, no problem. It's her right. But if she feels that, look, I'm unable to practice my Islamic duty to Allah because of the way we're living, then the husband needs to look into a solution for that. May Allah make it easy for us. I don't mean to tamper with cultures and I don't mean to change things, but I do mean to support those who are going through a lot of problems because of uh, living together with people who are difficult. It's not easy. I'd rather live separately and sometimes even a bit of a distance and have respect with the rest of my family than to live together and everyone hates each other. Living together does not depict unity in Islam. But respecting each other is what depicts unity in Islam. I'd rather meet, uh, you know, once a month, once every two months on the occasion of Eid as a large family and be so excited and happy than to be in each other's face every day and swearing each other. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. I've just given you an example. And people need to think because a lot of the older people, especially those who might have made a bit of money and they have bigger homes, they insist on the son living in the same home after they're married. But hang on, you know what? It doesn't mean that everyone living together, uh, you know, shows the rest of the world that, oh, we're one close, big, nice, lovely family. Maybe each one is depressed and stressed in the home and the world thinks, oh, mashallah, what a lovely home. We'd rather, you know, use the solutions that are practical. And this is why I know of people who've shifted all the way to Dubai just to stay away from the politics. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May He grant us ease. May He open our doors really. Jazakumullah khair. It's been a pleasant evening. Whatever we've said that was correct by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything I've said that is wrong from me and shaitan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu.